Hello and welcome to Access Chat. I'm delighted that today's guest is one of our own. So it's Mark Wilcock. Mark works with me and Antonio um, in the accessibility team at Atos. Uh, and the topic today that we're going to talk about is apprenticeships. Now, this is something that's close to my heart and I think probably close to Mark's heart too, since you started your journey in accessibility as one of our first cohort of apprentices. So Mark, over to you if you'd like to introduce yourself and uh, tell us your experience of that. Thanks for that introduction, Neil. Yep, uh, I am really passionate about apprenticeships because I think it provides a great uh, pathway for people to uh, skill up uh, into an area that they really believe in uh, without having to go to university or through another traditional kind of means whilst kind of getting that hands-on experience, which I think is invaluable. Uh, especially in such a niche field such as accessibility. I think there's not enough training out there or, or not enough formal training, uh, which has kind of a formal accreditation uh, that can really get people into, into this field. Uh, so yeah, it's been a great road to this point to, to get the apprenticeship uh, scheme built uh, and uh, finally signed off uh, as of a few days ago by the uh, Secretary of State of Education. But uh, that's obviously just within the UK, but obviously that framework can be can be used elsewhere uh, to really kind of further the the expertise in this field. So, so, so to recap a little bit, yeah, you know, we started apprenticeships with a sort of tacking on accessibility onto a software development apprenticeship, which is how you came to work for us. Um, because there wasn't an apprenticeship for accessibility and over the last few years. Mark and I have worked together with other people in our in our field to to sort of pull this together in the UK. We work with BBC, Barclays, Lloyd's, Shell, uh, local council. I think it's Northamptonshire County Council. There was um, interest, and we've consulted with museums and like the Tate Modern. Um, disabled persons organizations like the RNIB and AbilityNet both participated actively in, in, in this. And the, the, the aim of it is to create a framework where we have the knowledge, skills and behavior mapped for uh, what we believe in an accessibility specialist, a digital accessibility specialist, because uh, we had to define what it was. Um, should be able to do at the end of their apprenticeship and um, so Mark has done a lot of the co work on that coordinating it putting up with me working with Jody um, and uh, working with the Institute for Apprenticeships which is an offshoot of the UK Department for Education. From, from, from your point of view Mark you know, I'm interested to know why you chose an apprenticeship in the first place and what your journey has been as well, because you've been with us seven years. Yep. Man and boy. Um, so, um, you know, wh what was it that, that made you decide you didn't want to go to uni university straight away and that you would rather do an apprenticeship? So, yep, I've been here seven years now. Uh, and the time has flied by. I can't believe <laughs> it's been seven years since I joined Atos all those all those days ago. Uh, a nice rainy day in Leeds. Mm. Uh, but in terms of kind of what brought me into an apprenticeship rather than kind of the other uh, more traditional kind of learning routes would be because I wanted to go into IT. Uh, I believe kind of getting the knowledge that you were actually going to be using on the job is 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 critical. Uh, but it's also, I think, a lot easier to to learn in an apprenticeship where you're getting hands-on experience with technologies that you're going to be using then and then, then and now, rather than learning about something that may be obsolete, what we see in the kind of the digital world these days, that technologies are moving so fast that what somebody was learning one year ago isn't relevant uh, in today's uh, landscape. Uh, so I think it's, it's great to kind of get you the knowledge that you need for the job, for the role. Uh, but also I'm, I'm definitely a more kind of hands-on person uh, and like to get kind of involved and uh, kind of involved more with less, uh, less knowledge and more practical applications of stuff. 
Mark, um, uh, one thing that we've sort of moved away from apprenticeships in the United States, uh, except for certain certain um, um, job types. Uh, I, I'm saying that wrong, but you know, I know that we still do like plumber apprenticeships, and we do a lot of construction apprenticeships, but. Um, and I know that our government, um, I believe Neil has talked to our government, our, um, in our Department of Labor, we have the Office of Disability Employment Policy, nicknamed ODEP. And I know that they've gotten involved through PEAT, P-E-A-T, to do apprenticeships. But I, I just, I never understood in a way why we as a society moved away from apprenticeships. Because as you, you know, as you point out, not everybody wants to go to college, you know, sometimes there are different paths, but accessibility is so complicated and so nuanced. And so what I, I love the idea, I, I'm really interested in what y'all have done. And I love the idea that you're making an apprenticeship because we do have courses, you know, on it becoming, you know, becoming an accessibility expert, but it's really, there's so many moving parts. And I was, I was talking to um, somebody the other day and they were getting in, they were interested in accessibility and they said, well, but what do you have to do? And why is it so complicated? And I said, well, it's not complicated. If you have to do one thing at a time, um, you can do it. Any graphics that you put out have to be presented in a textual way. Don't use color, blah, blah. It's the sheer volume of what you have to do when you're an organization like ATOS, the sheer amount of it that is so overwhelming. And I, I, I think this was an investor I was talking to that wanted to invest and wanted to understand why we can't just use overlays. And I was like, you know, you can't sidestep, you know, what has to be done to truly, you know, be accessible. But I'm just hoping that we start bringing more apprenticeships back because we have interns and those things, but they very rarely really lead to real employment. Whereas apprenticeships historically have led to employment. I mean, you've been at ATOS for seven years. That, that's amazing. And I, so I, I just think it's a really powerful program but, and I know you probably, I, I don't know if you know this answer. I don't know why, why is society, we even move away from apprenticeships because I like you learn best when I get to do it because I can try to absorb it by listening, by seeing, but if you really want me to learn it, let me do it. It's almost like when I'm driving, if I'm driving, you know, I can find my way back, but if somebody else is driving, I, I'm. I tend to not pay attention. <laughs> oh, look at the pretty flowers. So in some ways I equate it to like that, but I really do think apprenticeships are so powerful. And I don't know if in the UK y'all also shifted away from them, but I was just curious what you think about this, because once again, society shifted away, but it sure seems like we need to move back. So I was just curious from your journey, if you agree and you know what would you recommend uh, on that topic? I know that's a big question. Uh, so <laughs> there, there definitely used to be in the UK anyway, uh, kind of a, a negative connotation around going on an apprenticeship uh, over going to university. Uh, and a lot of organizations kind of more in the past have placed a really heavy uh, reliance on having a degree to get a job, to get through the door, which is why a lot of people, I think, I think shifted away from apprenticeships because if <clears throat> if a job needs a degree to get through the door, then then the only way you can get to that job is really going through a degree. But I think there's been, in the UK at least, a massive uh, shift from getting away from, uh, you know, just requiring a degree. Lots of companies are now saying, if you don't have a degree, if you've got kind of relevant experience, uh, a longer relevant experience in that field, then that's that's adequate or, or, or equal. Uh, and I think in the UK, at least, I, I can't speak for the United States, uh, but they, they've kind of structured apprenticeships to have uh, somewhat equivalent value to degrees now. So there's, uh, a variety of levels you can achieve in in uh, apprenticeships. So uh, there's level, I think, one to eight, I think it is, or one to seven. Uh, I'm not sure how high they go. Uh, but that's basically from uh, the start of 
uh, lower education to to postgraduate like master degrees equivalents and so they map across so they have value which I think is really critical uh, so there's there's an equivalent to so for myself I started on a level four apprenticeship uh, with Atos for software development because uh, we didn't have an uh, accessibility apprenticeship like Neil mentioned before and we kind of tagged it on as on the job training uh, and then I've kind of progressed from that and done a level five and six uh, which is basically the equivalent of a degree so I've, I've completed a degree and got that same certificate that somebody would have if they if I'd gone to university still following that path of, of uh, being an apprentice and and obviously <laughs> with the, the generous support of Atos I've done that without uh, many of the uh, financial burdens that that places on you uh, which uh, as I'm greatly thank thankful for uh, but I think the the apprenticeship it, it, it's it's about the value uh, and delivering that that on the job training, which is I think in a lot of professions is so valuable. Uh, obviously, every profession you can't do it through an apprenticeship. There are certain professions that I think you know that, that there needs to be kind of that really in depth degree uh, qualification. But there's so many professions out there that 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 could be you know greatly bolstered by providing apprenticeships and and it's a great route to get more people into the field especially in accessibility where in the UK we have a, a lack of a lack of a, a talent pipeline well I am fascinated with this because in the first place you can get a degree most degrees you get you get out of college and you don't know how to do the job. And you know, that's true. You can get an English degree. You can get a history degree. You can get a fine art. I, I, you know, I know. Right? I have a fine art degree. I, right. Well, it, uh, it, it's just funny because a lot of times you get a degree, but then you don't know how to do the job. So it just yeah. makes so much more sense what you're doing. And I love that you actually now have the degree because you did the work. You didn't go in, I'm not saying going in class isn't work, but I, I, it just seems that we're doing it so back ass work. So gosh, I love what you're doing. I have, and I have to say that, that, that there is a mix. So, so um, the, it's not all hands-on learning. So there is classroom learning. So we, when we, when we make the apprenticeships and, and a lot of the work that, that Mark's done and I've done you know, with the help of the other people in the Trailblazer group and the Institute for Apprenticeships is actually working out what are the things that are going to be course-based learning? What do we expect people to learn? Working with education providers. So there is sort of classroom-based learning. So, you, you know, you got taught to code, you got taught to test, you know, you, you know there will be classroom-based learning about screen readers and accessibility standards and all of this kind of stuff as well as the, the practical side. And, and then what Mark forgot to also tell you that the degree he got was a first class degree. So, um, you know, it's-, it's What it's, does that yeah. mean? What does that mean? I, in, in the States, I don't know what first class degree means. That's the top mark. So here we call it, we have bachelors of arts, we have yeah, bachelor so of science. Yeah, I'm, I'm, sorry, I'm just trying it, to translate it in my head. Yeah, but it but it would be like with you know it would be sort of the, you know, so normally they're graded you know bachelor sorry you get a BSc or a BA with honors and then you get a, a grading of first two one two two or a third or a pass. Okay. I don't know, think so, that. Yeah. So so you know no, no, so what happens here is you have day release. So you, you're working on the job and then you get time off to go and do your coursework. I mean, wow. it doesn't, so it doesn't, and, and I've benefited from this as well. So, I mean, I, I was passionate about the idea of apprenticeships because I benefited from doing my master's day release with my previous employer and got business relevant skills. So I did a, an MBA in technology operations management, which stood me in good stead for understanding the complexities of large organizations and technology, which helped me in the role that I'm doing now. So hats off to Mark, because actually to, to get a really good Mark like that, when you're working as well is tough. So it takes commitment. But the, the point being, the things that you raised are that, yes, we want that mixture of on the job and off the job learning. And you, you, you referenced um, IAAP. We aligned with IAAP. 
so that anyone that completes the apprenticeship will qualify for membership. You know, they'll be accepted as a member. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Mark, uh, they would also should be able to sail through the WAS and the CPEC. Yeah, so I think we align to the the bodies of knowledge that they publish uh, along those lines. So whilst they don't actually gain the qualifications through the scheme, uh, they should be able to uh, sit those exams and pass them comfortably with the knowledge that we we learn. And and in terms of kind of how we laid it out, uh, the I the not the the Institute for Apprenticeships requires that you basically break down. Uh, an apprentice's, apprentice's knowledge, uh, skills and behaviors. So what you expect them to be able to basically achieve uh, at the end. Uh, and what we did is we took a kind of a broad approach across the organizations that we, we engaged in the Trailblazer group uh, to ensure that we weren't just providing a scheme that was specific to, to, to Atos, uh, but it could be used by any organization that wanted kind of an, an accessibility uh, expert, if you want to call them that, or a specialist. Uh, and they should be able to kind of do a variety of roles. So it's not just testing. It's not just kind of project management. It's, it's a huge amalgamation of them all. Uh, but obviously we couldn't cover everything because it would be so, so high level, but that it's, there's a broad enough perspective there that, that somebody should be able to kind of comfortably uh, employ an apprentice through that. So, uh, on, on that point, Mark, can you do, do a, a little bit of a kind of a breakdown f from that scheme? You know, what, what, what are what is included in, in the program and what at the end of it what expectations people might have in relation to their careers okay so in terms of kind of the whole uh quick a uh, quick kind of uh, route around where we started where we and what we've kind of done so initially it was about forming the trailblazer group so that was gathering those that, that group of organizations that was passionate about providing apprenticeships uh and also organizations that would actually be willing to take on apprentices through this scheme when it actually got published. Uh, kind of the next step from that was defining the duties. So that's what I kind of just mentioned before would be where we outlined uh, the roles, the responsibilities, the kind of tasks that you'd expect an apprentice to be able to complete or you'd want an apprentice to be able to complete once they've completed the learning, obviously not during the scheme. Uh, so, so what the kind of the main ones we targeted uh, were uh, testing, because uh, obviously that's quite a large part uh, of, of what a lot of organizations do. So accessibility testing, and uh, we align to some of the European and UK uh, legislations, because obviously uh, where we're creating it, it's a, a UK and I specific scheme. Uh, uh, they had the project management, so working out how accessibility kind of fitted into the bigger picture. Uh, where it might be positioned, what kind of tasks you might have to do during your project. Uh, we had a bit about support uh, and a support analyst. So supporting people with different assistive technologies, uh, how, how a service desk can be operated uh, with uh, people with disabilities in mind uh, and all of that, all of those things. Uh, and then we had the uh, document document specific parts. So remediating documents, creating accessible presentations, uh, all of those parts. So that kind of aligns to kind of comms uh, and marketing departments. Uh, and then obviously we, we wrap that with kind of the, the general knowledge around accessibility. So the general knowledge about different types of disabilities, uh, how they impact people, uh, how, how you can and others can support them uh, and all of that, that kind of stuff. Um, so so if, if, you, if, if today, if you have to tell someone, okay, you know, there's something here that you can apply, there's a career opportunity for you. Uh, uh, what would be, let's say, how would you sell this apprenticeship to someone else? So in terms of kind of where, where it would be marketed at first, so before anybody could really apply, uh, it would need organizations such as Atos to, to u utilize the standard. So what would happen is they'd open like a, a job opening uh, using this standard and within the UK uh, and I, there's uh, what, what they what the Institute called uh, funding bandings. So it's not something that the company has to fully uh, fund. Uh, so they are supported in, in employing these individuals uh, with a portion of the training. I'm not sure if Neil knows the exact uh, portion or, or the size, but there, there's a percentage that basically the UK government provide 
So it, it basically enables organizations of all sizes to take these individuals on and basically just pay a portion or, or their salary rather than the cost uh, extensive to the training. Uh, so, so once those openings are open by the company, anybody, anybody could apply for those. Uh, a uh, school leaver or anybody kind of in later in their career and want reskilling. Uh, one actually thing that I've learned through this process is that apprentice apprenticeships are actually utilized by the, uh, the older demographic more than the younger, uh, which was actually a, sh a shocking statistic. I didn't realize people used apprenticeships so widely for upskilling rather than kind of uh, once they've left school uh, as, as kind of a next step in their career. Yeah. So uh, yeah, particularly, um, so when I've been doing the work with the Institute of Coding, they were looking at the level six and above. So the, the sort of degree and master's level apprenticeships and, and what people were doing was lots of companies were using it for reskilling uh, people that you know, were mid-career. And, and so we're wanting to, to do further stuff. So to, to explain a little bit further for those outside of, of the UK, there is this tax that large companies pay called the apprenticeship levy. Uh, and so every large company has to pay into this. Um, but if you're sensible, you'll want to get your money back out by um, getting good, well-trained people back because the uh, the scheme subsidizes the vast majority of the training. You, you essentially pay the, you know, there's a wage structure. So you have to pay minimum wage plus, you know, um, which we do. Um, and, uh, and, in return for that, there's also a framework where people get promoted over time. Um, as you go through your apprenticeship, you hit certain milestones, you get a bit more money, um, slightly higher grading, etc. And at the end of it, obviously, you get a, a certification which is equivalent to an academic qualification. And the funding for the accessibility specialist apprenticeship uh, that has been granted by the government pays for £16,000 worth of the training. So all of the sort of academic training is, is pretty much funded and the employer only pays about £1,500. So 90% so funded because of the apprenticeship levy. And of, of course you have to pay the, the employment costs, but at the end of the, the two years, you end up with someone that is as good or better than me on a lot of the technical aspects, probably better than me on the technical aspects because my my skills have got really rusty over the years because all I'm doing is sitting on conference calls. But but um, so you know, Mark's testament to the fact and his colleagues, you know, Kyle and Jack and 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 the the, the next generations. We're on a third cohort now. We'll and we'll continue. Um, so I'm, I'm going to get absolutely slapped by Luke and Oliver and Kirill and everyone else when I forget loads of people's names. But what we end up is, is with people that have a really well-rounded accessibility knowledge uh, rather than people like me, people like our generation who've come into accessibility and have picked it up as we've gone along. So people have the, the we, we've sat down amongst ourselves and worked out pretty much what's everything we need you would like people to know and built that into a course and structured it and had to have it in a way that was explainable to non-experts worked with the education providers because this is the other bit was we then have to find people that would provide the formal education to be able to describe to them what they need to deliver they come and provide a quotation for delivering the, the, the formal education part that goes to the government for approval. Um, and so this is why we're celebrating today, because we've taken the best part of three years to go from the point of starting the process of saying, yeah, we're, right, we're, we'll start this trailblazer group to getting the approval and, uh, and everything from the government. But now, it's a recognized profession in the UK because this is, uh, you know, essentially the government now recognizes accessibility as an occupation uh, and one where there is formal training attached. So, so there was a duality of purpose to this. The first is that, you know, we need to train more people with good skills and this is a way of, and a framework of doing it. And the second is, is to get recognition that this is a, a real occupation. 
So no, to, to put, uh, uh, I need some some context in in order to help to, to clarify some of the points in English to the training and and the need in market in the market and how useful it is. You know, we have plenty of trainings and uh, all over Europe no, no, similar to this, uh, but sometimes they are not that aligned. So you go to a training, you receive a certification at the end, but then you are left in limbo looking for a job trying to identify who actually needs you. So uh, how is this one here working and, and, and how is the program in UK works in order to make sure that there are some uh, alignment between you know, the expectations of the people who apply for these programs and the industry itself? So in the UK, uh, specifically within Atos, I can't comment for other companies, but when you're employed as an apprentice, uh, there is kind of a, an agreement that would there will be an ongoing role. So like you mentioned there, that, that once the training's over, there is a job at the end of it. There is a, a vacancy that, that should be uh, fulfilled. Uh, and that will basically provide that ap apprentice the reassurance that the skills they're actually learning will uh, be uh, fruitful for a job, uh, that there is progression past that point. Uh, but in terms of kind of the, the other part, uh, like uh, Neil, Neil uh, mentioned and alluded to before, that, that it's linked to the wider uh, qualification kind of framework. So the accessibility uh, apprenticeship uh, is lev uh, level four apprenticeship. So that's the equivalent of basically the first year of your university degree. So whereas a company might certificate you in uh, accessibility, uh, it doesn't actually have like the backing of, of of the wider uh, learning framework, uh, which an apprenticeship does provide. So even if you were to take this apprenticeship and you decided actually, uh, I've had a great experience, I've learned lots, but the, the, it's not for me, you still have that qualification that provides kind of a credit, uh, qualification credits, if you want to put it that way, towards getting a different job in a different kind of profession. So. It, it provides kind of more more backup rather than just kind of going to it to a company uh, that other apprenticeships. I, I just think this is a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant idea. I, I, I personally think we need to do this in every single country, but just selfishly, I really want us to do it in the US. I, I know that um, we have really struggled um, growing the accessibility community. And the reality is with all the lawsuits that are happening in the States, we need seasoned accessibility professionals so bad. We need them so bad. So I would... I wish that we could take this and we could apply it to other countries. And I know that's a big ask, but it is really brilliant. And this is the way people learn. So uh, I wish uh, we don't have a, you know, an apprenticeship scheme like that, but that is so smart, but maybe we should, and maybe other countries could, but this could solve so many problems that we have with the reskilling, with, uh, um, you know, the school's not, the college is not really knowing how yet, or I sh I, that's probably not the right words, but to, to, to create accessibility professionals like you, Mark, and your peers. Can so I ask you a question, really, Deborah? Really, really brilliant. Can I ask yeah, you a question, Deborah? No, no, you're not. <laughs> so, uh, we here we are trying to to uh, address uh, uh, an issue and try to to fill in a gap that exists. From your experience as a professional working in this area, uh, when you talk with organizations about you know, accessibility, uh, what feeling do you have in relation to who they believe accessibility should be allocated uh, to a designer, to a developer? Where are they? You know, it, it feels because I feel I have the feeling that sometimes. Nobody really knows, and they are trying just to try to identify who has some knowledge in order to jump into the wagon, because I think that's precisely what we are trying to uh, sort out here with this with this program. Right, and I think that's a really great question, and the reality is they don't know, and I would say maybe one percent know but most of them don't know. They don't know, they don't understand, which is one reason why I think we're so confused in the States with, oh, you can put this overlay on top and it's only $50 a month and you're done. And they want that. But I think in, 
and, and I'm glad, I'm sorry, but I'm glad we're doing it at the same time. But all the litigation that we're doing is causing such terrible confusion. And then what the corporations did, which you can't blame them, was they took the brightest talents, a lot of our bright talent out of the marketplace, because if you're going to put this much pressure on me, compliance and litigation wise, and you're attacking my brand on top of it, well, fine, I'm going to grab the genisons of the world, the real top talents, I'm going to take them out of the marketplace. But then it just, we didn't have enough built up like this, what you are doing. And so what, so what's happening in the States is they're going to do whatever they have to do to try to make sure if they get sued, that it looks like they have a plan in place because it's just mass confusion. There is mass confusion in the United States with accessibility. It, there, it's ridiculous. And the lawsuits are jumping and jumping and jumping. And, and the, even the court systems and the legal systems don't understand this. So I understand that we used the, what is the carrot and the stick, and we have a gigantic stick that we're beating everybody with. But the thing that's so frustrating to the corporations and others is that it's like, but what is your plan, accessibility community, disability community, to create talent like the marks of the world? So, and you know what, I know I'm speaking in general terms, but I talk, you know, to corporations all day long, all over. And so, you know, that's why ATOS always impresses me because it's like, why are y'all being so clever? How are you? I understand you're fulfilling a need, but why? And so now I'm being selfish and I'm going back to society, but ATOS, please, will you please come and teach every? Well, y'all need to go to the Valuable 500 and teach all the corporations and the Valuable 500 to do this. Because I'm sorry that we are asking corporations to solve our greatest social issues, uh, but I think we are, right? I mean, Mark is a byproduct of that. So, so yes, we're, we're fulfilling a selfish need, but we're also fulfilling a need for society, absolutely. And, and there was that duality of intent, right? So, um, we, yes, we definitely, we need more. Uh, and actually, we need a wider pool than just within our own organization. So, so we want lots of other organizations, including people that compete with us, to, to put people through the... The apprenticeship because everybody needs to be doing this right um yes. and then we create uh, a vibrant labor pool of skilled individuals that we need because we have this tsunami of accessibility work a tsunami of content you know, you know Neil, that, I'm, yeah. I'm interrupting you but i want to interrupt you on purpose also the really cool thing about what you're doing is that mark is not qualified just to be an accessibility expert mark would add value. Sorry, Mark. I'm just, yeah, I'm promoting you now, but Mark would add value in any, any other part of your organization because of these technical skills he has. So I, I, I know, you know that, but I want others to understand no. that too, because having these foundations is making, I mean, people are going to probably, probably try to steal Mark from you now, but. Well, they have, <laughs> but I'm not letting okay. you go. You, what you can't see is the, the enormous shackle underneath the paper. Which, which <laughs> That's why his screen is blurred. That's why his screen is blurred because he can't get out. <laughs> yeah. no, but but, but in, in all seriousness, well, I mean, Mark, you might well want to talk about the role that you're now in because essentially what I've asked Mark to do and he's taken on a new role is to spread this learning across the whole of our organization. Wow. So he's responsible now for accessibility knowledge management yeah so uh firstly to kind of uh jump back to your question a while ago deborah uh about kind of implementing it in the united states the great thing about the work we've actually done over here is that it's all kind of like open source if you want to say it like that uh and it's actually all freely available on uh the institute for apprenticeship and I think technical education website, I think they've rebranded recently. So if you actually just Google uh, digital uh, specialist, digital accessibility, digital accessibility specialist apprenticeship, apprenticeship, it should yeah, it should pop up and you can click that and it shows all the knowledge, skills and behaviours, uh, how they're all kind of all mapped to the different duties. And I think you can download a, a nice Word document with it all compiled in for you rather than yeah. having to even copy and paste it. Uh, yeah. So, so it is all open source and it can be used by anyone. And we do say, you know, jump in and use it if, if you want in your local countries. Uh, 
but but obviously what we're going to use that for as well is we're like neil mentioned uh in in the the new role that i'll be uh, taking on we're going to be using those kind of foundations that we've created for the apprenticeship and actually utilize them for learning internally uh, within uh, atos uh, because once you've got those foundations you can build uh, upon those and then build it into specific job roles as well because the apprenticeship's so broad you can actually just choose specific sections if you want and, and target those two specific uh, professions that people you know if a developer you need to make a developer more aware of accessibility those parts are already included in the apprenticeship uh, for, for, for that apprentice to learn. So you can utilize those specific parts in an alternative training uh, practice if you want. Wow. It's very impressive. Very, very impressive. Oh, no. Well, this is why when people say, what's the proudest thing you've done, it's this. Actually, you know, because this is um, this has been a you know this an access chat, of course, um, but but in terms of actually, you know, whether I think this will have an impact, I think it will because I mean it's 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 taken a long time. Well, and look but, at the results. Yeah, look at yeah. The results well, you've well, had. My gosh, the results speak for themselves. It's but, amazing. Uh, so so you know we didn't you know we've been sort of holding off and holding off because it's taken ages to get to the point where it's fine actually we i went on the website and it says it's ready for delivery approved for delivery on the website now uh, so 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 yes you can go to the website you can download the entire apprenticeship standard the knowledge skills behaviors all of the mappings you can also get the um the grading descriptors and all of this stuff as well so you can see the ass assessment plan so what what you'd be expected to to be able to you know how you would get graded and all of this kind of stuff so yeah it's all there you know we need to you know have a big shout out to the people that really also really put in a lot of time you know um jody greer who who's now with be people smart but was at shell at the time uh, German, who has moved from AbilityNet to the Home Office, Zara Gemmel from Hex Productions as well, you know, the, uh, you know as well as you know the the contributors from RNIB and AbilityNet and BBC and 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 and, and Mike Link, I think NASA was in there too. Uh, we'll be thanking him at the end anyway. Um, NASA. But um, but yeah, so so it, many hands make light work, but it's been a it's been a long time coming but i think that this is this is something that will have utility for lots of people i agree yep. i have a question if i'm a if i was a major corporation watching this and i i think it's great that you're giving me the links that i can download it but if i wanted to come to atos because atos is a provider if i wanted to come to atos and i wanted atos to teach me this gigantic technology company to do what you've done you know, is that this something ATOS would help another? Because I know that you're a system integrator. Would y'all help a client? Oh, yeah. So, so yes, but not necessarily through. I wanted you to help me put an apprentice in so that I have, um, well, because right now there's not enough people in the marketplace. Yeah. So, and this is actually something Why you're doing it. Us. Yeah, no, no, but we are being asked. So, you know, partners of ours are interested in, in, in both things. So the, the apprentices will stay with the employer. So, so this right. is the thing. The, um, the way that it's being designed is that there is enough off the job learning and enough structure for the course for companies where, you know, they could be either really tiny or really large, doesn't matter. Essentially, you know, there will be enough sort of support there for someone to sort of learn stuff on the job and then learn off the job. And I think there's also some of the stuff that we'll, as a community, need to do is there's been talk about helping people have rotational placements so so that there is the option for people to, to experience stuff in other organisations as part of the apprenticeship. But the aim is that when you take on an apprentice, you're going to employ, employ them, right? And, and that this is a, an investment, mm -hmm. right? It's an investment uh, in, in the individual, 
because you, you're making a commitment to that person for you know several years because you know it's a, a couple of years where you know you're taking someone that has you know taking someone from no skills to the end result so there's a period where you're paying someone and they're not going to bring money in for you um at, at the same so so you, you have that investment but at the same time at the end of it you've got people that are you know more junior therefore not your 55 year old three thousand dollar a day accessibility swami or guru that that um that m means that you've got high skilled cost effective you know, employees that could potentially be with you for decades, hopefully, right. so long as you don't break out of the shackles, um, that, <laughs> that, that you can then develop, you know, and, and that have a career. And, and, you know, most people in accessibility until this point, it's a second career. Right. Or third or fourth. Right. Yeah. And, and as Mark very eloquently said, he feels very thankful and loyal to Atos for investing in him. Yeah. So, you know, employees stay with you if they you feel later. like you take care of them. You pay you later. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, no, I mean, I, I, you know, it is something that we're proud of. And we're proud of, of, all, of, the, um, of all of the apprentices that have been through our doors. And even the ones that have left, they're still working, bar one, still working in accessibility. So out of all of the people that have been... such a it's there's so many benefits to this there's so many benefits to our community the community of people with disabilities but to the corporations to the technologists to the designers i i think y'all should be extremely proud this is like no. no and it, it's a it's a, a modern program for organizations you know that are you no know, interested in digitally transforming part of their services there's also huh? that element is is the fact that it bring it, it brings that element of uh, being an updated uh, uh, module of training and education that is fit for the purpose of modern organizations. Yeah, yeah and, on, awesome. and on that point, Antonio, as part of the actual uh, process by the the institute, uh, every few years, I'm not sure the exact time frame, the actual apprenticeships actually reviewed, uh, and they take on board kind of shifts in technology. So, mm -hmm. it, it because it's just been released now, it's up to date. Uh, but hopefully, because of how all of the content's reviewed and how uh, it's updated uh, with another kind of trailblazer group in, in the future, uh, it should still be relevant in years to come. Uh, so it can it can keep being utilized. It's not going to kind of go out of date uh, uh, or, and then not become useful. Uh, it should always kind of be up to date and useful. And, and how it's actually structured provides that flexibility. The apprentice doesn't for example, need to be a master in a specific programming language or, or a certain application. Uh, it's, it's, it's laid out in a way that it's flexible, that they could still pass and get, uh, you know, a high, high qualification, high, high pass mark, being in a totally different uh, scenario than, than a different apprentice in a different organization, uh, which, is, it, which is great because it provides that kind of flexibility. Great. Bravo, uh, bravo. So we've more than done a half hour um i got carried away today so i um, need to thank barclays access microlink and my clear text for keeping us on air uh keeping us captioned keeping us happy so um look forward to you joining us on on twitter on tuesday mark i think we'll you know you know the community so we'll have fun yes yep. and congratulations to everybody and mark special congratulations to you thank you thank you for having me on it's been a great honor and I'll see you on Tuesday. Yes, yes. And congratulations, Neil and Antonio and Atos, because this is how we move forward. So I, I'm very impressed.